Let's, let's start with this question today. We know that Christmas is the season for giving gifts. How many of you, be honest, you're in church, that at one point you got a gift that you didn't like? Put your hand up. Now, next question. How many of you are sitting beside the person that gave you the gift that you didn't like? Be honest. Awesome. Okay, great. Now, here's an opportunity for you to redeem yourself. How many of you believe the person that you are sitting beside is a gift? Put your hand up. Awesome. Great. Well, Christmas is a time for, for giving gifts, and if we're honest, sometimes we get gifts that we love, sometimes we get gifts that we don't love. And there's three options that you have when you get a gift. The first is this. You get a gift that you love, and you love it, and it's awesome. And it's like, yes, I've always wanted this pair of underwear. Thank you. These are great. You know, I want to be the guy. Have you seen the commercial where they take you outside and there's a giant ribbon around a new BMW? Like, is that... Is, that just doesn't happen in, in my life. I get like the underwear. It's just what it is. But it's okay. So you like the gift, you keep the gift. The second option is you get a gift that you don't like and you just throw it away. You just go, I'm never going to use it. It's a dollar store candle. Awesome. Great. It's going in the garbage. Or third thing, and this is what I want to talk about. How many of you have ever heard of re-gifting? Re-gifting. Re okay. Brilliant. Here's what re-gifting is. When you get some something that you don't like, and you give it back to somebody that you don't like. That's, that's re-gifting. And uh, I'm just kidding. But what re-gifting is, is when you get something and you go, I'm never going to use this. Uh, it's not for me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage it and I'm going to give it back to someone else. So he here's how this works. I want to give you three helpful hints today if you are ever going to re-gift a gift that you would do it the right way. Sound good? First thing, when you re-gift a gift, don't use the same wrapping paper because people will know. They look at the paper, the paper's been ripped, the tape has been ripped, at least wrap it up in a different wrapping paper. Secondly, make sure that you change the name tag on the gift. You, you don't want to give like someone a gift, you get it, and it says like Tim, and then you give Bob the gift, and it says like Tim on the, you don't want to do that. And thirdly, most importantly, make sure that you don't give the gift back to the person that gave you the gift, because that would be really weird. So you, you don't want to do that. But listen, I think we can all agree that giving is really, really important. But in the Old Testament, in biblical times, giving gifts was not only important, it was essential. You could not approach the king without offering a gift. Giving was essential. You never came in the presence of someone in a high position, a high office, someone that you would honor without offering up a gift. You just didn't do it. It was insulting if you showed up without a gift when you went before the king or a dignitary. In, in other words, if you showed up empty-handed, that was not good. You always came before the king, came before a dignitary, offering a fine gift. And this same thinking in the Old Testament applied to the tabernacle. It applied to the church. So that you never went to the church before Jehovah who resided in the tabernacle, Old Testament name for God, you never went into the tabernacle without offering up a great gift to a great God because you could not interact with God if you didn't bring a gift. In other words, no gift, no access. That you were separated from God unless you brought a gift. So people would bring their best gifts. They would bring, check this out, gold and silver and bronze and fine linen like rams and oxen and goats and lambs. And if you didn't have anything super nice, they still expected you to bring something. So the people that didn't have a lot would bring two turtle doves. And that's where that actually comes from, two turtle doves. They would offer up these doves. Because watch this again, no gift, no access. But then something dramatic happens in the New Testament at that first Christmas. There is a seismic shift that happens that first Christmas. And watch this. It is no longer about us sending gifts up to the king. Now it's about God sending the king down as a gift. It's about our great God showing up. Come on, somebody. Dressing up in skin. 
coming to the earth as one of us. The Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. No longer was about what we could give to God. Now it's about what God can give to us. There, there is a shift in what happens. And it's an incredible different way of thinking. It's like, oh my gosh, everything has changed. Because before, no gift, no access, but now we have access through the gift. Yeah, now watch this, Old Testament, Psalm 68, 18. When you ascended on high, you took many captives. The Bible says, watch, God, you received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, even people, God, that, that you were angry with or they were angry with you. Again, Old Testament God, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. You received gifts from people. But fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says something profound, and he is quoting kind of what was said in Psalm 68, but he adds this. He said this in Ephesians 4, 7. He said, now Christ has generously divided out his gifts to us. So watch this. Not only is Jesus a great gift, Jesus is the giver of gifts. Amen. Did you get that? So sometimes we think Jesus is the gift. No, Jesus is the giver of gifts. He's the gift that keeps on giving. That's right. That's right. And sometimes we just go, well, we got the gift. No, he is the giver of gifts. And watch this. This is where a spiritual gift exchange should take place in your life. This is where re-gifting should happen. This is where you get an opportunity to give your junk to Jesus, and in return, he gives you back a good gift. You give him your mess, he gives you his mercy. You give him your failures, he gives you his holiness. You give him your sickness, he gives you divine healing. You give him your fear, he gives you his courage. You give him your sadness, come on, he brings you joy abundantly. There's an exchange. You, you give him your sin, he gives you forgiveness. You, you give him your losses, he gives you victory. You give him your jacked up past, he gives you a brand new heart and a brand new start. He is the giver of gifts. Come on, he'll give you a good thing. But I want to pause in this moment and ask you a question. If you're in the room and you're, and you're suffering with like anxiety and worry and fear and you're overwhelmed and there's no joy in your life, could it be that you're holding on to something that you should have given to Jesus so that he could give you something in return? There's an exchange that takes place, a holy exchange where gifts are exchanged. Now, watch, before we just gave something to God, now God gives something to us. And it happens through Jesus slash Jehovah. Can I show you that the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God in the New Testament. However, there are some details that are different. It is the same God, different name. Same power, different access. I want to take a moment and show you that Jehovah is Jesus and Jesus is Jehovah. Can we do that? Can we, can we go a little deeper today, 1130? Can we drill down below the surface? Because if you get this today, the meaning of Christmas is going to come alive in your life like never before. So, so stay tuned in to where we're going to go and what we're going to talk about. So Jehovah, the, the first appearance, if you will, of this name happens when Moses is in the desert and he's wandering around and he's looking for some answers and suddenly he sees this bush that is burning and he's wondering why the bush isn't being consumed by the flame. And if you walk in through the woods or walk through the desert and you see a bush that's on fire, what are you going to do? You're going to go like, whoa, I want to check this out. He goes up to the bush. The bush starts speaking, says, hey, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And there's a conversation and, and God speaking through this burning bush says, Moses, I know that you're going to have a hard time understanding this, but I have chosen you to lead my people out of slavery. They've been in captivity for 400 years. You are going to be the one that leads them from, from captivity to freedom. And then, then Moses goes, oh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this, but, but who shall I say is sending me? And then this is where God uses this word translated Jehovah, and here's what he said. Tell them, I am who I am, or I am the one who is, has sent you. 
listen, this is so important. I am who I am. I am the one that is. Is God saying, I am self-sufficient. That my existence is not based off of you or anyone else. I don't need anyone or anything or any place or any situation for me to exist. I am independent from everyone else. I am who I am. I am Jehovah, the great I am. Now watch this. Jesus is Jehovah in the New Testament because in John 8, 58, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And he continues this language of I am throughout his ministry. And he keeps talking about himself being the great I am. In John 6, 35, he said, I am the bread of life. I've got a gift for you. And whoever eats of this bread will never go hungry again. Some of you have been looking for something to satisfy you. You're looking in the wrong place. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but come on, somebody. They will have the light of life. If you've ever been in a dark place, come on, Jesus is the light of the world. In John 10, he said, I am the door of the sheep. In John 10, 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I am, watch this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whatever's dead in your life, he can bring it back to life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. In John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, I am God. And Christmas is God is saying, I am here not to get something from you, but to give something to you. I am who I am. This is who he is, and this is what he does. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. Somebody should just... If you're grateful for the great I am, would you just get on your feet and take 10 seconds and give God your best praise in this place? Just make as much noise as you can. He's God. He dressed up in skin. He's come and he's dwelt among us. He's not far away. He's a personal God who's got a personal plan for your life. Woo. Jesus is God. Tell your neighbor, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Tell the person on the other side, that was your second choice. Jesus is God. Now, some of you are like, okay, pastor, I get it. I get it. But let, let me ask you a question. Why would this great God, the King of Kings, show up in some stinky barn to some unwed 14-year-old girl. I mean, in my mind, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, we're talking about the king of kings. Why, why would God show up like that to some unwed 14-year-old girl in some stinky barn? Can I show you something? I've got two things here. I've got a really nicely wrapped box, and I've got an old paper sack that's wrinkled and smells like old bologna. <laughs> okay, watch this. If I were to offer you your choice of gifts, most of you, rightfully so, would look at the wrinkled, old, stinky, brown paper sack and then you would look at this, and what would you say? Pastor, if you're going to give me something, I want what's in this box because of the presentation. There's a penny in this box. I'll just put it in my pocket. In this old, stinky brown paper bag, there is a hundred dollar bill. What's my point? Don't let the packaging fool you. Don't let the packaging fool you. 
instead of coming to earth as some pampered, privileged ruler. Jesus was born in meekness as one of us. He is approachable and accessible and available. No palace gates bar the way for him. No ring of guards prevent our approach. The king of kings came humbly as a baby born in a barn. What am I saying? Don't let the packaging fool you. He is the great I am. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He is our eternal salvation. Come on, he is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the vine. He is God dressed up in skin, who has come not to get something from you, but to give something to you. Come on, give God thanks today. If you're not yet convinced, my hope that in the next few minutes of our time together, you will be absolutely convinced without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus, in fact, is God. And to do that, what I would like to do in the rest of the time that we have is I would like to construct a biblical paternity test today in the church to find out who his dad really is. In order to do that, what I would like to do is I would like to see this sacred space in this moment switch into a court of law. Tell your neighbor, church is in session. Tell your your other neighbor, court is in session. I'd like to present to you the evidence that is found in Ezekiel, the Old Testament, chapter 13, starting at verse uh, 37, starting at verse 13. Ezekiel said, then you, my people, will know that I am Lord. And what he is saying is this is how you are going to know that God shows up on planet Earth when I open your graves and bring you up from them. At this time, I'd like to call Lazarus to the stand. Lazarus, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me Jesus. Why didn't you say God? I did. Lazarus. The evidence shows that in John 11, starting at verse 17, that when Jesus showed up, you'd already been in the tomb for four days. Is that correct? I don't know. I was dead. I don't know how long I was. I was dead. Lazarus. Are you, are you sure like you, you weren't just taking a nap? Yeah, it was a dirt nap, bro. I was dead. I was done. It was over. Put a fork in me. I was dead. Let's continue to look at the evidence found in John eleven thirty eight. 38. It says in, in this text that your sister, Lazarus, is this accurate, that your sister said and warned Jesus that there could be possibly a problem of odor coming from the grave. Yeah, that's very possible. May I suggest that it, it could have been the fact that you didn't put on deodorant that day, that, that the bad odor was body odor. It wasn't body odor. I was stinking dead four days in the grave. I was dead, stinking dead. Do you get that? I get that. Can you tell me, Lazarus, what happened next? Yes, I can tell you. I was dead, but suddenly I heard a voice, and the voice that I heard was from my friend Jesus. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, I didn't have a choice but to listen to that voice because that voice is not only my friend, that voice is God. That voice is the great I am. That voice is the beginning and the end. And when Jesus tells me to do something, come on, I do what he said. Let's continue with the evidence. I'd like to call... Job to the stand. Job, is it true that your book is the oldest book in the Bible? Yes, that's true. Job, is it true that what you wrote is something that you saw? Yes, that's true. Can we look at what you saw? Let's take a look. In Job 9.8, Job, it says that you wrote this down. He stretches out the heavens by himself and walks on the waves of the sea. Job, what is it that you're saying? 
I can't tell you. All I know is I saw a vision of God coming down to earth, and then I saw him walking on the water. At this point, I'd like to pause and call Matthew to the stand. Matthew, would you come to the stand? Yes, sir. Matthew, what can you tell me? All I know is me and the boys were hanging out in the boat, and here comes our rabbi, Jesus, the teacher, and he is walking across the water. What did you do? What did you think we do? We screamed. We were freaking out. We'd never seen anything like it. What did he say to you? He said, take courage. It is I. And I want to pause in this moment. For anyone that feels like you may be sinking, Jesus is saying the same thing to you that he said to them. Take courage. Amen. It is I. Can we continue the court session as we call some additional people to the stand to show you that without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is Jehovah. He is the great I am. I'd like for you to look at the text that is found in the book of Isaiah, which was written 600 years prior to Jesus showing up. Isaiah 35.4. Say to those with fearful hearts, and this is a word for somebody in the church today, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance and he will come to save you. Now check this out. In the next verse, this is what he's saying is going to happen when God comes. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. I'd like to call my final two witnesses to the stand. Bartimaeus, would you please come to the stand? I'm here. Is it true that your name was previously blind, Bartimaeus? That's true. Well, what has changed? I don't know what has changed. Jesus showed up, and I was blind, but now I can see. That's all I know. I don't have anything else. I was one way. Jesus touched me, and now I'm another way. My final witness, I'd like to call to the stand. Can we bring forward the man that had been paralyzed for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda? Come forward. Notice how the man that had been paralyzed now comes forward. He's not limping. He's not pulling himself. He comes walking boldly to the witness stand. How is it, sir, unnamed man that had been there for 38 years, what is it that allowed you to walk to the witness stand today? I was at the stand I was at the pool, and I was at the same place that I'd always been doing what I've always done, just kind of complaining that nothing could change in my life. And then Jesus showed up, and Jesus looked at me, and he asked me a very important question. He, uh, he said this. He said, do you want to get well? And then as I began to give him an excuse, he just gave me an order that overrided the thing that I was trying to keep from doing. And he said, would you just quit talking about it? And would you pick up your mat and walk? And all I know is that I got up and I started to walk and I am who I am because of the great I am. I can do what I can do because of the great I am. And I'm telling somebody today, you've been limping, but you're about to start walking. You've been limping, you're about to start running. Come on, God's got a good plan for your life. What am I saying? Listen. Listen, 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 listen. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, who are these people? You're new to the church and you're like, these people are all flipping crazy. No, listen, listen, listen. Jesus is not just a baby born in a manger. Jesus is a great God that has come down so that you can have an abundant life and things can change in your life. It's for your marriage. It's for your family. It's for your finances. It's for your health. It's for your future. It's for your dreams. It's for a greater purpose in your life. That's what all this is about. That's what all this is about. Are you with me? Now lean in because we're going to go somewhere in the last few minutes that we have. Look at Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus is saying this to us. So if you sinful people, now he's not saying this as a put down. He's saying this comparing us to God. And how many of you know compared to God, we're sinful? Like we're messed up. So he's saying if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, quick show of hands, parents, how many of you want to give your kids good gifts this Christmas? Right? Most of us, you want to give your kids something great. How many of you know, watch this, 
people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Now, I want you to notice what he didn't say. How much more grace will he give to those that ask? How much more mercy, he didn't say that, will he give to those that ask? He didn't even say how much more forgiveness. What did he say? How much more of the Holy Spirit? Why did he say this? Watch this. He's saying, because when I give you the Holy Spirit, I'm giving you me. I'm giving you me. Please hear me. The purpose of Christmas is more than a baby born in a manger. It's about God giving us the gift that keeps on giving. Now, let's, let's take a turn, but stay with me. This is going to make sense to some people. There's going to be like a light bulb moment. You're going to get this. Watch this. Matthew 1, 23. This is a Christmas verse. We use it all the time. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here's the problem. That was 2,000 years ago. How's God with us? He was born lived a perfect life, died a brutal death, was put in the grave, rose from the dead, spent 40 days back here on earth. But then the Bible says he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. So how can a God that's in heaven still be with us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And this is so important because there are some of us in this room, and I'm going to show you in these last few minutes, that what you need more than anything, the greatest gift that you can get this Christmas, it's not that you don't have Jesus, you need more of his spirit. You need more of the Holy Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit will correct you, it will protect you, watch this, he will convict you, and he will comfort you. He's there wherever you are. Did you know that God sees everything that you do? He knows every thought that you think. He knows every idle word you've ever spoken. That he sees it all. He's there. You can't go anywhere without the Spirit of God being with you. If you've said yes to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. But there is a difference between God being with you and now God being in you. Can we go somewhere? 2 Corinthians 9.15, here's what Paul said. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. The Holy Spirit is so good, he's saying, I can't even put words on it. He lets me do things that I could have never done. He lets me say things that I could have never said. He lets me think, oh, help me somebody. He lets me be the me that God created me to be that I can't be without the presence of God in me. Oh, that'll preach. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're responding right now. Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Come on, are you smelling what I'm stepping in today? So what I'd like to do in the time that we have left, I want to give you three quick things that the Holy Spirit, why the Holy Spirit is so important in your life and it's the greatest gift that you can have access to anytime you need it. And here's the first thing. Number one, first thing, the Holy Spirit makes us more like Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to go, but what I'm going to give you is better than me being with you. It's the power of God being in you. I want to talk about this word that the Holy Spirit allows to happen in our life that some of us really need to pay attention to, and it's called sanctification, and this is the process that the Holy Spirit uses to change us, and what it is, the the best way that, it's a big word, but really we make it way more complicated than it should be. It's stripping away our sinful habits, bringing us into holiness. Piece by piece, layer by layer. So I want you to think like this. Think of yourself as like an onion, okay? And you're just, what, here's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Peeling layers away. And in the inside of that is holiness. So we are all on this journey. The Holy Spirit, if he is with us, He's stripping away layer by layer. Now, I get it. Some of you are pretty big onions. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot, of, a lot of layers, a lot of stripping to do. But, but what I'm saying is this is what the Holy Spirit of God will do. And he'll just peel back layer after layer after layer. Because there is a difference in using Christianity as a label than actually Christianity being something that has changed you to be more like Jesus. 
Because anyone can say, I'm a Christian. That doesn't matter. You can say that you're a horse. You can say you're a cat. People do it all the time now. Oh, I'm a cat. No, you're flipping crazy is what you are. I'm just saying, you're not a cat. And if you could say, I'm a Christian, here's the deal. Watch. Are the layers being stripped back? Are you becoming more and more like Jesus and less and less like who you were? Sanctification. Here's the second thing. The Holy Spirit gives us power to witness. In Acts 1.8, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be able to tell people about me everywhere you go. That you'll have a power that you normally wouldn't have. And there are people in the room, listen, quick show of hands, just be honest. How many of you, sometimes it's awkward to tell people about your relationship with Jesus? Just put your hand up. Yeah, thanks for being honest. It can be weird. But here's what I'm telling you. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's no longer your power. It's God's power. It's no, it's no longer something that you have to go, oh, I don't know what to do. God will show you what to do. And he calls us, the way the world changes is not through me preaching, it's through you talking. At some point, this got, got messed up. We said that our, our, our religion, our, our religion, our, our relationship with God should be private. No, no, no. It's personal, but it should never be private. We should be telling everyone we know the greatest news that Jesus is who he said he is and he can do what he said he can do and the way that he changed my life, he can change your life. But you need power to be able to do this. So on your way out today, you're going to get some invites. And I'm going to challenge everybody in the church, ask the Holy Spirit to give you power just to invite somebody to one of our Christmas services because your invitation can lead to a conversation that will cause transformation and change eternal destination. And it starts with just you telling somebody about him. Just, just step out of your comfort, zone and tr your, your comfort zone and trust God to use you. And I'm telling you, there's nothing like seeing somebody that you know come to know the Lord as a result of your invitation. But you need power. You need the Holy Spirit to do that. Here's the last one. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Listen. Conviction is your best friend. There are, there are some people that you, you just don't feel it anymore. You like just do what you do and you're just like, man, I'm, but there are others in this room and tell me if I'm right. Like, you know when you're off course. You, you don't need me beating you up. The Holy Spirit is prompting you and telling you, whoa, 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 this needs to stop. It's not going to end well. You're moving away from God. He'll convict you. I want to give you a quick story. We always keep it real here at TE Church, and there's a... Uh, a young girl that attends our church. I've known her for years. And she, she got honest with me. And she said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I said, what's up? And she said, I've been smoking weed for years. And the Spirit of God began to convict, convict me. And it, he kept tapping me on the shoulder. And I knew that I knew that I knew that it wasn't my best life. And, he said, I, and she said, I just want to tell you that I've quit smoking weed. Amen. And then I said, yeah, and watch this. I said, well, tell me about it. Like, what? She said, listen. She said, I've never experienced God the way that I experience God now without that sin in my life. Without that... Sin blocks the presence of God from your life. And I don't care what it is. And listen, people say, well, pastor, you should be telling those people, you got to stop. It, I am not the Holy Spirit. My job as your pastor is to build you up, not beat you up. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. It is your job to listen and obey. But that's what the Holy Spirit will do. He convicts us. So he, here's what I want to do in this moment, real quick. These three things that we just talked about. If you're in the room and you, you feel like, 
man, I, I feel like I want to change, but I just keep going back to the same thing, and I keep making the same mistakes, and you feel like, man, I, I just need God's power in my life. Would you just be honest and put your hand up and say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. Yep, most of the room. Most of the room. How about this? There are people in the room that you just have a fear of inviting people and telling people about Jesus. If that's you, just, put, just be honest. Like, man, I, I, it's not that I don't love God. I just struggle with telling people about God. Yeah, here's the last thing that you know there is some unresolved sin in your life that God's been tapping you on the shoulder about and you've been ignoring. Would you put your hand up if that's you? Thanks for your honesty. Here's what I want to do as we close. I want to pray. And at TE Church, we believe in the power of prayer. And there's nothing too great for our great God. But it comes down to you and I saying, God, I need more. How much more will he give those that ask? So what I'm going to do today is we're, we're going to pray. And, and for everyone in the room that you want more of God, and let me tell you, you can't do it without him, by the way. You can't do it without him. So why don't you put your pride on the shelf? You put an elf on the shelf. Why don't you put the pride on the shelf right now? And let's go to our great God. For everyone that needs more Jesus, would you put your hand in the air right now this Advent season? Just raise your hand high. Father, my hand's up. Both hands are up. Jesus, because I need more of you, because I can't do what you've called me to do without your presence and your power. And I pray for every hand that's raised in our church. God, even those that aren't raised, that they know right now you're speaking to them too. And God, that you would just give them what they need. And God, what we need is more of you, the great I am. That, that we have access to the greatest gift of all time. God, that the great, it's like blows my mind, like the, but that you've come, that we may have access to you, the King. So Father, for every hand that's raised, Jesus, I pray that there is a spiritual transaction happening between the heavens and this house. That you are touching them, and giving them the strength and the remembrance that you've given them everything they need to do everything you've called them to do. Father, we love you. Move mightily in this house this Christmas season. Jesus, that you would be exalted and all men, women, and children would come to know you, not as a baby in a barn, but as the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Great I Am. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, and amen, and amen.